Hello everyone, welcome to the second day of our NF Core Training September 2023 edition. So yesterday, in the first day of this training, we were, uh, you guys were introduced to a few sections of the training material, the official community training. We saw a slide deck presenting Nextflow in the background, why it was created, why it's useful, some features of the uh, technology. And then in the official training material, we, we had a look in the introduction section, the setting up your environment section, the getting started with Nextflow, configuration, managing dependencies, and deployment scenarios, including Nextflow Tower. So the idea is that if you found the pipeline on the internet, the Nextflow pipeline, and you want to use it and have a somewhat superficial understanding of what it's doing, how it's doing stuff, how you can change the configuration to adapt to your needs, you have the basic knowledge for that now. Today, we have a different purpose. The idea is to help you understand the uh, concepts required to write your next flow pipeline and by the end of the day today you will be able to write your own pipeline the, la the last section will be uh, writing a proof of concept RNA seq next flow pipeline so that's gonna be very exciting uh, we will start having a look at ne what are next flow channels next flow processes channel operators uh, cache and resume and then the proof of concept RNA seq pipeline the third day, which is tomorrow, will be with Chris Hackard introducing you to NF Core, the project, NF Core, the, the NF Core knowledge required for you as a user, and the NF Core knowledge required for you as a developer, a pipeline developer, a module developer, and so on. So keep uh, watching these, these sessions because tomorrow is going to be very, very interesting if you want to take advantage of the enormous amount of, of content, including pipelines, modules, and some workflows that the NF Core project. Uh, has available for you. So having said that, let's go back to the training material. I'd like to emphasize that by entering the website, there is a button open in Gitpod. And by clicking on this button, you will be taken to a, to the, to the, to a Gitpod workspace like this one you are seeing now, where you can see the content and interact with the workspace with the terminal here. It's what we did yesterday, it's the same thing. So let's go to the channels section and start. Okay. So, if you watched the session yesterday, you've probably already seen a, a figure like this one a few times. We have a task alpha, for example. There are there's an input channel that is consumed by this process. Every element is gonna give, uh, is gonna instantiate this process in the task alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and so on. And after the processing of this task, the, whatever it's supposed to do, at the end, it will have an element. And if you have the set of tasks related to the same process, you will have this channel of output, right? In this example here, we have a channel with three elements, file X, Y, and Z. And this output channel will be the input channel to the next task of another process. So here, task beta, for example. And then we have this multiple times happening. So we could say that these three elements together, they, they form a workflow. You have processes, you have channels. But in this section, we're going to focus on this middle part, the channel. Okay. So the first thing to, to keep in mind is that Nextflow has two types of channels. We have queue channels and we have value channels. So far, every time I refer to channel, both today and yesterday, I was referring to queue channels. But today, we're gonna also see these value channels. So the, the definition of the queue channel is pretty much what I was, what, what I told you yesterday. So basically it's an asynchronous, unidirectional, first in, first out queue, it's a data structure that connects two processes or operators or a process in an operator or an operator in a process as I said before, processes and operators, they are functions, like in the regular functioning programming languages, but here they are special. They are next row processes, they are next row operators. They interact with channels, which is a specific type of variable. So the asynchronous here means that the operations are non-blocking, so that if you have enough resources and your configuration is not preventing the processes to instantiate, it will keep consuming this channel uh, with other processes. It's undirectional because the data flows from a producer to a consumer. So a process alpha is going to receive some input, some, some input channel. It's going to 
output an output channel and this one will be consumed by the next one. So we always have a producer and a consumer. And the FIFO means that the data is guaranteed to be delivered in the same order as it's produced. So first in, first out. I briefly mentioned this yesterday that actually it's a bit trickier than that because if you have a channel of elements, it's guaranteed that the first element in this, in this channel to be consumed will be the first one. But maybe the first one is going to take much longer than the second one to be ready, the processing to be ready, which means that maybe in the next channel, the second one will be the first one and the first will be the second one. There's a process directive called FAIR, FAIR threading, that you can use to guarantee this ordering after the, the parallelization. But what you have to, to keep in mind here that this FIFO means that the first element to be consumed in the channel is the first one and then the second one and so on. If they all take the same time, you will have the same ordering at the end. Uh, whenever you use a channel factory, which is a function to create channels, you will create a queue channel it's by default. So here we can create uh, example at an app, a new file, and I'm going to copy paste this snippet here, which basically uses channel of, which is a channel factory, is a function that creates a channel. And I'm providing three elements here, one, two, and three. So it will be a channel with three elements. The println is a programming language that is a groovy function to print the content of a variable. Here it will be weird because this is not a regular variable, it's a channel, it's an actual channel. And here we would use the view, which is a channel operator, to view the content of a channel. That's the right way to look at it. And then you see that this println is not very useful because you cannot really see the content of the channel. So let's go, next we'll run. I think it was example.nf. So you see the, what the println prints to the screen is some not really understandable content. It's important for Nextflow to know that we have a data flow broadcast and a data flow stream, but for us, we don't care about it. We want to see the content of the channel. And that's what the Nextflow, the, the channel operator view does, one, two, and three. They are in different lines because they are three different elements. If we used the collect channel operator, like we did yesterday in one of the examples, you would see they would be in between brackets in one line because we would have one element which has three items. Okay, so that's the, the correct way to, to do it. It's actually what we just did, right? We created this example.nf file, we put this inside and we ran this Nextflow pipeline, let's call it like this, the Nextflow script. But then we don't really have to spend much time with queue channels because that's what we have been using the whole time and talking about the whole time. The new thing here is the value channel. They're also called singleton channels, right? The idea of a value channel is that first, it's a single element. Value channels are always single element channels. That's why they are also called singleton channels. And they have one very interesting characteristic. They are implicitly created whenever you use a channel operator that returns a single element. So you have first, last, collect, count, I mean, all these channel operators here, they generate a single element. So if I have a Q channel with 10 numbers and I, I apply first to it, it will get the first one, which is a single element. And therefore, this new channel will be a value channel. But then there's a very important difference between Q channels and value channels, one that you have always to pay attention. And this example is very good to show what's the difference here. So let's copy this and modify the example.nf script that we had written before. So we are creating a channel here, a Q channel, because we are using a channel factory, right? One, two, and three. And this other channel here has only one. So three elements, one element. Then we have this step, it's a process called sum that receives two values, X and Y. The output is just printing to the screen in the script block that, that, that shows what's being done here, we have this. This is actually a bash uh, expression, it's not next row. It's what you would do in the command line. You're again, just using bash to show example, one example here. Then in the workflow block, we say, I want to run the sum process with these two channel as inputs. 
channel one, channel two. And then I want to view the content of this output channel, which has the sum of the two elements. If we run this, something very unexpected will happen. We should have two as the output, the sum of one plus one, and that's it. So what happens here is that Q channels, elements in Q channels can only be consumed once. So the one from channel two was consumed to sum with the one from channel one, but the process didn't create a task for two and three because we don't have more elements in the channel two. So this is a very common thing. Sometimes we have 10 samples, we run a process and we only see one task. And we ask ourselves like, why don't I have 10 tasks if I have 10 samples? So probably one of the channels that you passed have a different number of elements. And because your queue channels, elements can only be consumed once, it will not generate tasks for the other uh, elements of the, different, of the other channels. One way to fix that is to, tr is to turn the second channel in a value channel. So there's actually one channel factory you can use for that, which is the value one. But here, we're gonna do different. We're gonna use first, which is, which is channel operator. It returns one value, the first element in a channel, which here is the only one we have, one. And now we will have a value channel. And by running the same pipeline with this small change, you will see that we're gonna have one plus one, two plus one, three plus one. So we have here what's expected. So this is a very nice tip. Whenever you, you see a different number of tasks from what you expected, be aware that maybe you have many queue channels and the number and the number of elements diverge. So you have to convert one of them into a value channel. That's what was ex explained here. So we have mentioned this channel factors a few times. Let's look at them into more detail now. So they are functions, just like any function but they are special functions that create channels from non-channels. That's important to say, because sometimes people have a channel and they want to create a channel with a channel. This won't work. So you have lists, files, strings, you have regular variables and you want to convert into a channel containing them. That's the way to go with channel factories. So the value one, it will create a value channel. So you need one uh, value and one only nothing is considered one because it's uh, uh, no, right? One of the most common channel factors is of, because it literally is like of anything. You can have a channel of numbers, files, lists, dictionaries, strings, I mean, anything. So here we create a channel with four elements, which are numbers. And we use the view operator to view the content of this channel. So this actually is related to a question that I answered today in the channel on NF Core. I would like to take this, uh, take this opportunity to remember that you should ask the questions in this SAP23 training foundational Slack channel, which you can find in the NF Core Slack. If you don't know how to join the NF Core Slack, there's a link, a link here. And this is the page of the Community Foundation Next World Training, right? But if you can't find this page, you, you can just go join NF Core here at the top, and then you choose Slack here, and you'll be able to join the, the channel and ask your questions. There are lots of people that are there ready and happy to help answering your questions. So coming back to this, the question I answered today is like, what, what's this thing with the curly braces, right? This is what we call a closure. So I'm gonna change this script to only contain that. I'm going to do the regular one, which is I want to use the view channel operator to see the content of the channel CH. But then I will also use the view with the curly braces, which is a closure. So a closure is when you pass a block of code as an argument to a function. So here I'm passing a string and whatever the element is, it's referred as it. If you want to refer it with another name for, like, for readability purposes, you can just do uh, something else like number and then you put value number and it will work. Let's put it like this. So when we run this, let's clear the screen. When you run this, you have this number, just the numbers, which is this line two, value and the number, which is the line three. Oops, I'm sorry. It should be without the dollar sign. 
So I'm saying that whatever it is, I'm gonna refer to it by the placeholder, by the variable number. And here I say number. If we don't say anything, it will be it. So we have here with value, with number, and just the number. Maybe we want to double it. We could do something like number, let's erase this. I want number times two. I don't know if this is going to work, but let's try it. Okay, it worked. So one times two, three times two, five times two, seven times two. I'm using this double quotes here because I want a string, right? And the reason I'm using the dollar sign is because outside strings I can only I can simply use the name of the variable, but inside strings to differentiate the variable from any other string, you have to use the dollar sign, right? And it's safer to use the curly braces when you want to do some operation or apply some function to to the number, right? So let's say that I want to convert this, uh, I don't know. Like if I do this, I'm just getting the number and this is a string. This is a nice example. So if I run this, I'm gonna have one star, two, three star and so on. But if I put it inside, then we know that we are doing an operation with this variable. So closures are a bit, I, would, I don't want to say advanced, but they are a bit difficult to digest at the beginning. They're not so obvious for people who are starting to program, but they are so useful. In your, in your path on learning NextFlow and writing NextFlow pipelines, channel operators and closures are extremely powerful. They are very, very important. And you can learn more about them in the Groovy introduction section that we will not cover in this training, but you're free to check the material. It's very, very nice. There's a part uh, on closure. And also in the official documentation, which is docs.nextflow.io, you have Nextflow scripting and you have closures here also, a session on closures. So again, we won't cover that, but it's very, very nice. If you want to write Nextflow pipelines and want to really feel the power of the Nextflow language, channel operators and closures are extremely important. Very, very nice. Okay, so the next channel uh, factory is from list. The name is quite, quite obvious. You're going to, cr to create a channel from a list. So let's copy this and replace inside to see what happens. I have a list here in Groovy, in Nextflow, you separate the elements in the list with the bracket, right? I mean, with a comma, but you specify it's a list with the brackets. And let's do Nextflow run example.nf to see what's happening here, what will happen. So we have hello and world. And this is a nice example because if you think for a second, you could say, why don't I just do this? of it's a channel of a list right yeah but we have one element here so if you print one element if that's what you want great you do it this way but usually people have a list of many elements and they want every element to be a single element in the channel and then the from list channel factory is, is very important for that as you can see here so let's go to the next uh, channel operator, which is the from path. So the from path is very interesting and very important if you are handling files. So the idea is to use is to provide a string with a glob pattern or the, the path to a specific file. So in this one here, it's looking for the current folder data, the, 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 the data folder in the current directory where we are inside the meta subfolder, this CSV files. So any file ending with .csv. If we open the file explorer here and we see that we have the data and the meta subfolder, we see two CSV files inside, patient one and patient two. Let's close the file explorer. Let's copy this snippet to our example.nf. I particularly like to use spacing like that to make it easier to view, uh, to understand the, the, the expressions, the, the, the chain operators, right? But it's just spacing, so it's up to you. It doesn't change. Technically, nothing changes, just uh, in terms of readability and a per personal preference of mine. So when we run this, we will see the two CSV files that we have in this path, which is patient one and patient two. If you want to instead have a single element to provide all the CSV files to your next process, you can use the collect channel operator 
that we've discussed a bit, but today we will get into, into more detail. But for now, let's keep with the basic understanding of it. And as you can see here, we have one element with two items, which is patient one and two CSV. Okay. So the glob pattern here that, that the description refers to is the star, it means anything ending with dot CSV. Uh, you can have more complex uh, shell globbing. You could do something like uh, like this, which means anything ending with underline one or two dot CSV. And when we run that, you see the same thing because actually you only have patient one and two, right? But I could just put one or three, for example, and then in this case, we would only get the first uh, CSV file, which is the patient's one. Okay, so let's go to the next. Uh, there's some information here, some options about the from path channel factory. I won't get into much detail here, but it's here for you to read if you want to get uh, more knowledge about this specific channel factory. And if you want to learn more about glob patterns, uh, you can just click this link and there's also some information. So there's an exercise here. If you want to pause to try to do it, do it now because I'm gonna show the solution, right? So the question is to use a channel from path channel factory to create a channel emitting all files with the suffix .fq in the data GGAL directory and any subdirectory in addition to hidden files. So as you see, there are some particular requests here and to, to understand how to do that you can check the the options here like hidden and so on so let's open the solution one two three and you see it's mostly what we did before so from path the difference here is that we have two stars and if you go a bit to the top you see that two stars it cross directory boundaries and we have the hidden true show hidden files also so let's copy this go to the example.nf and see what happens. I'm gonna type clear to clear the screen and run again our next row script. Get one, two, leave it one, two, land one, two, cool. The next channel factory is a very commonly used one for, for in bioinformatics. It's called from file pairs. So as you can see here in this list of files that we saw, we have pairs of samples. So get one and get two liver one and liver two and link one and link two. We have pairs of files. And this channel factory from file pairs is very useful to handle this and you will see why. Here we have six elements and we know that actually they should be three, right? With some information about uh, where the files are and some ID of this list of files that relates that re re relates to the, re to the same sample, right? So let's copy this snippet here. Let's go to the example.nf and let's run it again. So by doing that, you see that we now have, instead of six, we have three elements in which every element is a tuple, which is a structure with many elements. So this element has a gut, which is an ID, and we have a list of paths of this gut sample, gut one and gut two. Same thing here, liver and a list of paths, liver one, liver two, and lung, lung one, lung two. So if you have pairs of files, like in parent, in parent sequencing, this is very nice. You can use this from file pairs channel factory to handle that for you. Again, you still have the cloud pattern, you have these options here, and you should read them if you want to get more knowledge about it. Again, a new exercise. So use this from file pairs channel factory to create a channel emitting all pairs of FASTQ read in this data GGAL directory and print them. Then use the flat through option to compare the output with the previous ex execution. So I'm going to show the solution. So if you want to try to do it, you can. You should read these options above because they will need, be needed to the solution. Three, two, one. Again, very similar from what we are doing, what we did before. Channel factory. This string referred to the path, and then we have flat true now. And the output of that. Let's check what will be. still one element for uh, I mean for every sample but now instead of having the ID in the list of trees we have it flattened we have three items at the same level which is this the sample the sample ID in the two files or more if there are more files 
Another interesting channel factor is from SRA. So this one makes it possible to query the NTBI SRA archive through their API and return the channel emitting the FASTQ files matching the specified selection criteria, which means that we're going to have this ID in the list of the reads for uh, a SRA ID that you provided, right? So here we have some, some instructions on how to, uh, to get your, your API key how to put it here, how to use the front as array by providing an ID, your API key, it will download everything for you. So this takes a while because these files are huge, so we won't do it here. But in the end, you have something like this. The ID and the list of the reads, right? The one and the two for every sample. You can also provide multiple accession IDs, like here, we have three, instead of only uh, the one that I did here. Here we have uh, a simple Nextflow pipeline using FastQC, but obtaining these reads, this, this data, with the Front SRA channel factory. Again, I won't run this because it's going to take like forever. Hmm. If you don't have FastQC installed in your machine, like you saw yesterday, we can use a bio, the BioContainer FastQC container image by just putting here container or in nextflow.config and running with, with Docker or by using Docker dot enable equal true in your configuration file. So all of this we saw yesterday, how to handle containers in this manage dependencies and containers section. So you can also work with text files. So once you use the front path channel factory to get this file, so here's a nice example because we are not using any globbing. We don't want to get multiple files in a path. We want one file specifically. And once we got it, we want to use the channel operator that again, we will see more today in the operator section. We're going to use split, set, split text to split the text in this file. So if we go, if we open the, op the file explorer and go to data meta random.txt, you see we have some random text here with seven lines. It's one text file with seven lines. Uh, by using the split text here, let's see what's going to happen. This first example here. So basically, from path to add this channel to a to add this this file to a channel, then I want I will use the split text uh, channel operator, and I'm going to use the option by ten, and then I'm going to use a closure here to whatever it is. It I'm going to use the I'm going to apply the function to uppercase to this thing, which means that I want it to be uppercase, right? And then I'm going to use the view channel operator. Oops, to see what's inside this channel. Let's see what happens. So you already saw the content of the random.txt, seven lines of text. Here, what do we have? So we have three, six, seven lines. Everything is uppercase, and every line is an element in our channel. So maybe we could do by two. And you see we have for every element two lines here so we can always go to the official documentation go to operators choose one here let's look at the split text and you see these options so the by defines the number of lines in each chunk so the default is one one line for element or you can group them in different elements so in this example here, we could, well, it's already, okay, we export already a lot in this one. So you can also use the subscribe channel operator that does something whenever one element is consumed from a channel. So this is good to explain how the split text with the buy option works. So I'm going to do buy two, and I'm going to add this end of chunk every time an element is consumed, right? Oops, okay, so let's do it here. So we have two lines, end of chunk, two lines, end of chunk, two lines, end of chunk, and here, what whatever was left. Mm, it keeps giving some examples. I, I won't really re repeat all these examples, but just different things you can do uh by 
getting data from inside a text file. You can also work with CSV files, comma separated values. So here we have the patient underlying one CSV that we played before. We're going to use the split CSV channel operator. And in the end, we're going to have a look at every row in our CSV. So if we open the patient underlying one, we have patient ID, JRA ID, S3 ID, number of samples, menu of eight regions, and so on. If we get this snippet here, let's try it out. Oops, is this the one that's here? No, oh, it's here, sorry. It's the first one that jumped. So if we run it, we are going to get the CSV. We're going to split the CSV according to the commas. And I, I'm going to call whatever comes in every element row. And I want the first one because it starts with zero and the fourth one. So the columns, right? The first column and the fourth column, which here will be, I closed it. So the first one is the patient ID. And then we're going to have the number of samples, we think. Let's run it. Yeah, so the ID and three, which is the number of samples, right? Number of samples, one, two, three, four. Yeah, number of samples. So we could get all of them, a few of them. Here we got the first and the fourth. You can also include the header with this option. You can, when you do that, you can also get by the name of the column instead of the position of the column. And there are many other things you, you can do here. With closures, as I showed a few times, you can do like a lot of magic. Here we are using a slash, uh, reverse slash T to add a tab between these two values. And there's so much we can do with that. These examples are very nice. You should uh, have a look with care in every one of them to make sure you understand what's going on. And if something is not clear, again, go to the, to the channel we created on the end and of course Slack to ask your question. So, we haven't seen the RNA-seq workflow yet. It's the last thing we're going to, we're going to see today. So this exercise is a bit uh, out of place. But if you want to try, or maybe I'm going to open the solution now, you can just have a look at how it's changing things to make it work. This is the process from the RNA-seq workflow. And these are the things that changed, right? Okay. Uh, there are also, you can also work with TSV. You're still going to use the split TSV function channel operator, but you're going to provide a new separator, which is reverse T, right? So here it asks you to, to use the tab separation technique on the regions.tsv file, but print just the first column and remove the, he the header. So with what we've shown so far, you can already do it by yourself. So if you want to pause the video to try to do it, you can do it, but I'm going to open the solution now. So as you can see, from path to load the file, we're just using here check if exists, which is going to throw an error if the file doesn't exist, instead of silently failing. It's just an option that you can check the documentation on the from path channel factory and see how it works. We're going to use the split CSV channel operator. I'm providing the new oper uh, separator, which is reverse slash T, is a TSV, right? I want the header and I want here the first uh, column, which is because we are using the header, we can call by the name patient ID. There are also more complex file formats, uh, like as, like JSON. We do have a channel operator for JSON, which is split JSON. There are some examples here with the output. Again, I don't want to get into much detail here because I think it, it can be slightly advanced for people who are just starting to use next floor programming, but again, you can, with Calm, have a look at this, every JSON file, the output, the search code with Nextflow to, to split that. With YAML, we have to use a bit of Groovy, but it can still be done. And one thing you can do, and this is a very nice feature of Nextflow, the modularity, that you will see tomorrow with Chris Hackard in more detail using NFCore modules and NFCore tools to help you with that. But the idea is that you can get some code, like this uh, YAML Groovy code here, code here, and you can write it to a file instead of having it written in your main workflow script. So you can just include a function from this file and call it uh, like here in your workflow script. It's, much, it's going to be much cleaner for you to read. 
so you can organize content like configurations, script files, everything you can organize in different files and just include them uh, in the main configuration file or the main script file and so on. So with that, we finished the first section of today, which is channels, and it's time now to go to the next one, which is processes. So now in the next section, we're going to talk about processes, which as we saw a few times already, are basically functions, right? But they're special functions, they're next row processes. So it's the basic computing primitive to execute foreign functions in Xlow. Every step of your pipeline, if you, if you think of your pipeline as a, as a set of steps, every step can be represented as a process. Here we have a very simple one, which is, we call it say hello. There's some um, preference usually to use uppercase names for processes, but it's not mandatory, it doesn't really have any technical uh, effect. It's just like indentation, right? But usually people use uppercase letters for process names. We have a very simple process here. We just have, that just has this script block with an echo hello world, right? Again, without the workflow block, nothing happens because we have to tell in the workflow block what processes should be called. In reality, processes can be much more complex than that. So it can have directives at the very beginning, which are declarations that define some optional settings of how the process should behave using containers or using Conda, requesting a specific amount of CPU, of memory, having some limitations for time and disk, among many other things. We have the input block, which has the expected inputs for this uh, process. I can have maybe a thousand files in my current directory, but maybe I just want two of them to be the inputs to the next process. So you, you specify them in the input block here. Same thing for the output block. So maybe the command that I'm going to run in this process is going to generate a thousand files, but maybe I just care about one of them, which is like the results of my analysis. So I only want to pass this results file to the next process. I don't care about the other ones. So the output block here is not like about what will be generated, but what will be generated and I want to be in the output channel. The when block is a condition that you can create to specify when the process will generate a task. So maybe you can say that if, they, if, if, they, if a specific input element is a number, fine, run, this, run a task. If it's not a number, don't do anything. So it's like a, you can think of it as a starting condition for a task. And then we have this discrete block here that can have different keywords, not only script, and we'll see soon uh, which they, what they do. But for now, think of this part as what will be done in this step of your pipeline. Okay, so here we have another example. So now we have the workflow block calling the example process. And we have here an echoing a string with some reverse slash n, which is a new line. And all of this being saved to a file named file. As I said many times, what's inside the script block, it's not Nextflow. It's some R code, Python code, MATLAB, or a program you're calling. In this case, as in many other examples that, are, that we have seen so far, we have shell script commands and expressions. So by after saving this in the file, I'm gonna get the content, I'm gonna get the first line, I'm gonna get the first five characters, if I recall correctly, and I'm gonna start this in the chunk on the line one TXT file. Then I'm going to compress this into a file name chunk underline archive.gz. Okay, that's what my process does. Let's copy this, paste here, and run this next little pipeline. Nothing will be shown because we, we're not saying anything to be shown. But we can get this hash here, which is the test directory, and use tree to see the tree structure. So work. And you see that we indeed have a file named file that was created here. We have the chunk underline one txt, and we have the chunk underline archive gz. There is no input, so it's fine, no, no input, but we don't have any output either. So if we requested the output channel of this process, we would have nothing because we didn't specify uh, what to be. So let's even try to do something like this, which is I want the output channel of this process and I want to apply a channel operator called view to view the content of this output channel. So if we run this, 
there's nothing actually to, to be called here. Let me try to do this. Yeah, but if you had put output and then path chunk archive.gz, here same thing but it's better this way so by using the view here with the pipe instead of using the dot same thing just better to read we have now the output the element in the output channel which is the chunk archive.gz but if we don't have this output block here and you run this then it can be applied to an undefined output because there's no output, right? We didn't specify an output here. So here we have a different one. And now instead of just share script, we have a Python code. And we use the Python shebang to, to let Nextflow know that it has to use Python to interpret the script file. So some Python code here. And you know, it's the same thing. We're just going to run for the sake of showing you the output, but in the end, you could have R, Python, MATLAB, you could have shell script, anything here, and it would work the same way. No output, so nothing printed to the screen. You can also use uh, parameters, as we saw before, to change some content, some variables inside the script block. So here we have the default value of parents to be the, uh, of date of the data parameter to be world. And we're going to say hello and whatever it is inside. If we run this, just running, we're going to have hello world. Okay. Either I do view here to see the content, or I put the bug through, put the book through here. Oh, there is no output. So I can do it like this the bug through. And we can see hello world. If I run this again with dash dash uh, data, oops, and I use uh, hello Marcel, we're gonna have hello Marcel here instead of hello world, as we saw yesterday. So good to go to the next part. Ah, okay, so one interesting thing is remember that when you have a dollar sign, it's a, it's a variable, right? So next row we'll try to resolve this variable just like it did here. So params data is a variable. What's the content of it? World, okay, fine. But what if it's not an actual variable? What if it's a bash variable? Like even in here in the terminal, I can use echo dollar sign pwd and we have the word the, the, to print the current working directory. So if instead I say here, echo pwd, pwd, what's going to happen? Let's see. Oops, there's no need to put this dash dash data. It showed the current folder. Where am I? Where I am right now. Good, but I didn't want that. I want the PWG of the task folder. When the when the script is being run, I want to know where it is. So I have to use a reverse slash here. Oops. And by doing that, next row will not resolve this variable. We have to escape the dollar sign here. And it will be interpreted and resolved when a task is being run. And here we have the test directory. So it could be the same thing for other variables, right? So escaping dollar sign among other things in your programming language in the script block may be required in order for Nextflow to know if this is a Nextflow variable or a variable in your programming language of the script block. Another way is to use single quotes, and then Nextflow won't try to, to to resolve this variable, right? 
uh, but this is not the only way. You can also, instead of script, you can use shell. And then the dollar signs will be for bash variables or whatever language you're using. And exclamation mark with the curly braces will be for the next little one. So some people prefer to use a shell so that you can have this obvious difference between next row variables and other variables. You can also have some conditional script. That's very useful. So I can have this file that I want to compress. I want to choose the gzip method to compress. And depending on the on the on the on this uh, parameter, I'm going to use a different program. So I have the workflow block here. I'm going to call the full process with this input, the file to compress. It's a file, so it will be converted into a value channel automatically when you call the process. But then, if the, the, the parameter for compress is gzip, use this script block for gzip. If it's bzip, use this one. If it's neither, throw an, uh, an argument saying unknown compressor in the name of the compressor that the person used. So if you want your process to behave differently based on a variable, that's what you're going to do, conditional scripts. So we can also have a look at the input block of our uh, process. So we, we discussed this a lot of times. So you have an input qualifier and you have the name of the input. So here I'm going to say it's a value and whatever is getting inside this process, I'm going to call, I'm going to refer to it as X. So here process job one, two and three, right? If, it, if there are files or paths, you use the path qualifier like we are doing here. So a channel from path, I'm going to have a channel where every element is a file and the process has that this is a file by using this path. So here I'm going to, whatever the name of the, of the file, it will be stored in my folder as this name. So let's try this because it's not so straightforward to understand what's going on. I'm going to remove no, I'm not going to remove. Let's just run this. Next flow, run next sample dot nf. So we know this data ggal uh, folder has all these six files here, right? And what I want to do is to um, okay. Let's to make it easier. Let's just get one, which is the good one fq. And I want to know where, what's the test there, right? It will be here, but just because we learned that to escape the dollar sign, let's play with it. So we know that the input is gut underline one fq. It's here. And here we have the path. So let's open it. And we know that the name of the input file, it be whatever it is, it will be overwritten with the name sample.fsq. So if we do a head here, minus n1, to get the first line of this file, that's the first line. And if we do the same with the data, ggl, good one, we get the same thing. So it's the same file. Indeed, we are inserting this file into our process, but we decided to rename it as sample.fsq. And you can also use a variable as a placeholder to refer to it, like we did many other times. Mm. This is an exercise here. Again, uh, you can pause the video now to try to do it. Otherwise, I'm going to open 3, 2, 1, the solution. So here the idea is to write a script that creates a channel containing all the read files matching this pattern, followed by a process that's going to concatenate them into a single file and print the first 10 lines. So I create a channel which with, with this uh, path here. From path, it's going to get all these first reads of these files. Got one, leave it one, and so on. And I have this concatenate process that receives lots of files, like everything that's in my input folder, I want it there. And the output is a file called top on the line, 10 on the line lines. I'm going to use the cat to get all the files in my current directory, which are the inputs. And I'm going to put them in this concatenated.txt file. Then I'm going to use head to get the first 10 lines and then I'm going to save in this file. Because I have many files and I don't want to have concatenate being called multiple times with one file because then there's not, nothing to concatenate, I'm using the collect, channel op, uh, the collect channel operator to send all these files at once for one instance of the concatenate process, which is a task. 
and then because all the files are there I want to concatenate them so let's run this and I want to show you what's inside the, the, the test directory which is all these input files so let's do a tree here and you see gut1, liver1, lang1 in the same task folder because it was a single task with all these input files so here we have two input files, two channels 1, 2, 3 and ABC see here that they are calling this full process with these two channels and indeed you can pass many channels to the same process here we say it's going to be a value and I'm going to refer to this value as X and here the same thing but I'm going to refer to this value as Y and the script basically prints to the screen X and Y and we have here uh, 1 and 2, 2 and 3 and so on the output is not exactly what was there but it's what you can guess from the, the script one and two, one and A, two and B, three and C. We already saw that. So what happens when channels do not have the same cardinality? One, two, but four letters. We saw this already. A and one and A, and two and B, and it stops. But if we make them a valid channel, then it's going to be to be called multiple times. One and A, one and B, one and C. Good. Just a reminder of something that we learned at the beginning of the channel section today. So here another exercise. So it's asking you to write a process that is executed for each read file matching the pattern and use the same uh, transcriptom.fa in each execution. So this is a very simple uh, problem just to remind you that you should use a value channel so that this transcriptom file can be used multiple times for all these different files. I'm going to open a solution in 3, 2, 1. So the secret here is passing this as a file that will be automatically converted into a value channel. Or you could maybe create a channel, the channel value, or use the first channel operator which returns one value and then it's going to be a value channel. The goal is to understand that you need value channels here when you want to use the same file multiple times for different elements of another channel which here is the read underline ch channel that is created we're using the from path channel factory one second for some water one very interesting thing you can do is the each qualifier so maybe you want to do you want to do some repetition so this example is very nice you have these tfa files and let's say you have three methods regular espresso and psy coffee so you could have a, a line sequences process that will get some sequence file and you want to do to this same file three times with different modes so i'm gonna run this command here with dash mode and the mode which is regular espresso psy coffee for the same file so you want to repeat this process three times just changing the mode and that's why you have the each mode so this is the repeat qualifier. It can be very useful in some situations. Here, you have a nice exercise to practice that. So you probably know Salmon and Callisto. They are very famous uh, pseudo aligners. And what it does here is ask you to write a process that we execute for each read in this uh, path here, matching this pattern, which is gut1, liver1, and lung1, but repeat the same task with both Salmon and Callisto. So I'm going to open the solution in three, two, one. So the secret is here, the each mode. And we have Salmon and Callisto. So Salmon, Reese, Rescue Tom, and so on. So this command is not going to work because the, the actually the command line of Salmon and Callisto is different, but you could have a conditional script here that we already saw saying if the mode is Callisto, do this. If the mode is Salmon, do this. Otherwise, throw an illegal exception. Now let's have a look at the output block. So we already saw we need an output qualifier, a tuple, a path, a whatever, a name for the output. It could be the name of the file that we want to, to save, for example. And one thing that we haven't mentioned yet, but is very useful, is to use emit to give a nice name to this output. So instead, of, there's gonna be some nice examples for that. Like sometimes you can have multiple output channels 
and you would say, okay, I want to see the first one, the second one, it would be better to have names for that. And the emit very useful. You use the dot out and the name of the uh, of the emit that you chose. So soon we're gonna have some examples. Uh, let's keep it in mind for now that the emit is very useful. So here, for example, you have a value x that's going to be received as input, a value x which is the output, and you want to store this x value to a file. The thing is, the file itself is not really what's going to be what for the for the output right so if they are files then great you can have the path and the name of the file that's good you can also have multiple output files so here for example i say the name of the file is chunk underline something so in the in the first example that we had today we had this multiple different output files sharing the beginning which is chunk underline and i want all of them to be in the output channel of this process here we are using the flat map operator i won't get into details about it now because soon we will be in the operator section and then i will talk more about it here we have an exercise which is to remove the flat map operator here and see the output change it's not really to do something but more to, to observe what's going to happen one interesting thing is that we can also have dynamic output file names. So here, for example, we have this process called align, which receives a value that I'm going to refer to it as x, and another value which I'm going to refer to it as seek. And the output of this process is the, is the name of x, probably is the name of the symbol, for example, so gut, I don't know, dot ALN. So you can have dynamic output file names. But pay attention that we are using here double quote to resolve this dollar sign here. We're saying this is a variable, right? So let's do a test here. So it's clear to you. And let's get inside the test folder. So we have cat ALN, sloth ALN, dog ALN, which are the species here, right? We call species channel as the first input channel, it's X. So we have cat, dog, and sloth, dot ALN. So here, how to create this output file. Here, what output files to watch to add to the output channel of this process. You can also have tuples, which are composite inputs and outputs. So here, this full process is expecting a single input channel. As you can see here, there's only one argument, one input channel. But this input channel consists of a value, which is a sample ID, I'm calling sample ID, and a path, which are the paths. Maybe this, it can sound a bit weird, but we already seen that. With the from file pairs channel factory, we saw that this is the structure it creates, an element which has a sample ID and a list of files, and that's what we have here. So here it asks you to modify the script of the previous exercise so that the bump file is named as the given simple ID. I'm going to show the solution in three, two, one. And you have here the simple ID being in the name of the output file. Here we have simple bump for everyone. Usually this is not a problem because knowing that every task is isolated in the test directory, it doesn't matter if they have the same name. But if you're passing this file around, it can get into a situation where you have all these files in the same folder, and then you're going to have a conflict because they all have the same name. So it's not very smart to have names like sample.bam because you can you can run into you can run into trouble very quickly. The win block, we briefly mentioned it about, about it already, but here you can see, you know, when uh, verify this condition here. So if the name, and then you have this expression here, or the type is in R, and, this it will, and then it will work or not, right? So we can copy this, paste here, run this pipeline. And we got the result, because the type is in R, and the faster name respects uh, some pattern. But if we have an array, for example, as a DB type, it will fail this condition and then this process won't create a task. So here we saw there was a task. This is a task folder, right? If we run it again, the DB type now is not an R. There is no process, no task 
right? No task was issued from this process because the condition was not met. The when, right? When it comes to directives, it's the first ones at the beginning of the process body. We saw this yesterday in multiple different sections. So here we are requesting two CPUs, one gigabyte of RAM, and to use this container image here for this process. So nothing really new. Here we have a few process directives. We saw many yesterday. And if you go to the next flow documentation to uh, processes, directives you have all these directives here i saw i showed you yesterday a few of them but as you can see there are many and you should definitely have a look including this part here about dynamic directives dynamic computing resources and dynamic retry with back off this is very very nice so you can also organize your outputs that's very nice using a, a directive called published year so when you run your pipeline you have your 10 steps for example it's pretty clear already that every task will be run in a test folder isolated for everything else and you have it stored in a crazy path like this one here this call.aln this cat.aln is kind of almost hidden in this path right so you don't want that you some of these output files you don't care because they're just intermediate steps intermediate files for your analysis but at some point you want some results from your analysis to be organized in the place so the published year directive allows you to choose a place to organize your outputs so that you can look at your results more easily. So here we have one example. I'm using published year for this process and I'm saying that I want it to be stored in this folder, which is depending on the out there parameter that I provided or the default one, which is my dash results. And the mode is copy because you can create links, shortcuts from the task folders to the published year to the directory where you publish your results, or you can copy them so that you can delete your work directory and you still you will, you will still have your files. And this can get very complex actually. You can make it very, very complex. Uh, this published directory is important to say that it can be local or remote. So you can use S3 buckets, for example, to, 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 to show your files, right? So here we have a bit more a bit more complex usage of published year. I'm saying, you know, in this full process, all the files ending in .fq, I want to store in this path here. All the files ending in whatever, underline console.txt, this path. And all files ending in underline outlook.txt, in this path. So you can have multiple published year directives for the same process. And again, it's a per process usage. So if you have one pipeline with 10 steps and you want the results of the third and the fifth step to be stored somewhere, you put your post directive for this third process and for the other one. You can put in the, in the process block like here, or you could put in the configuration files like we saw yesterday with the process scope with name or with label uh, for the process, right? And with that, we get to the end of our process uh, section. I insist that you check the documentation, the official documentation, because there are some directives that are very, very interesting here, including this three uses here in the end. This is a very nice thing. They're, they're relatively complex, but amazing things you can do with dynamic usage of directives. And there are also other things that you can do with processes like stubs. This is very, very nice. And but again, it's a foundational training. We cannot cover everything. So in the end, a few things have to be left out so that you can focus on the things that allow you to start using Nextflow as soon as possible, right? So there's still this managing semantic subdirectories. Yeah, that's what I just showed with this pattern and stuff. Okay, with that, we go to the next section, which is Nextflow channel operators. So these operators, just like functions in channel factories, they are functions, but they are special ones. They are special functions that apply to channels, to Nextflow channels. If you go to the Nextflow official documentation and you go to the operation operators, you're going to see a very long list. And again, I recommend you to have a look at each of these operators so that you, you are aware of what you can do with them. 
closures with operators is one of the best things about Nextflow. It, can, it allows you to do amazing things with your processes and with your channels. So they can be organized in some categories like filtering operators, transforming operators, splitting operators, among other things. Here we won't show all of them, but we will show a few of them that are very interesting. So I like this example because it allows you to, to see how closures and the map channel operator work. The map is one of the most used channel operators. It's very, very useful. And I'm going to show you a few examples here. So the first thing that we do, remembering that you can click on the plus and get a description of what's happening in the search code. We are creating a channel of four numbers. So every number here is one element. Later, I get this channel that I call nums and I'm going to apply the map channel operator to do something. I'm going to multiply every number to itself. I'm going to, I'm going to square them, right? I'm going to start this to a channel named square. You can ask what's the IT, it's like an iterate, right? Uh, dash bigger than here, four. So earlier I replied to a question saying that view is the same thing as view IT, right? It is the same thing as view IT like this. But actually this format here of using this dash and bigger than is when you want to use a different name. But they are the same thing. You can just do what I did here and it's fine. You can also ignore this part. So let's copy this, go to our example at NF, and I'm going to remove this it here because it's not required. It's the same result. And we're going to have two, four, six, oh, sorry, two, four, nine, and 16 because we are squaring everyone. One times one, two times two, three times three, four times four. And this figure here shows us what happens. I have this channel with the elements and every element is going to be doubled. Sorry, every element is going to be multiplied by itself. You're taking the square here. Uh, we can also, instead of doing like creating this, all these variables, we can use the dot to chain all of them together, right? It's more beautiful. And as I said earlier, I like to use these spaces to make it clear. So I'm going to create a channel of these elements and then I'm going to map them and view them. I like to separate in lines with the spacing. So it's really clear. As soon as you put your eyes on the code, it's clear to you what's what's happening here. As opposed to do something like this, which some people do sometimes, and in my opinion, it's so bad. Like you look at the code and you have to be very careful to understand what's going on, what's happening first, and so on. So let's look at the basic operators. The view operator we saw a few times already, actually a lot of times, it's going to consume every element in the channel. And then we have it here. We can use a closure to change the way it's going to be represented in the end. We saw this a few times already. The map one, we can do something to every element. This is actually very nice because you can even change the structure. So if I do this, I'm going to have one, two, three, four. But what if I want to repeat the number. I could have something like the number and the number again. And now I have still four elements, but every element has two items, which is the name repeated. And maybe I could do something like multiplying by two and here multiplying by itself. So whenever you want to organize the way your, your, your items are in the channel element, the map operator is very useful. Sometimes, for example, you have things like uh, long, uh, you know, some info and some other info, for example. So it's uh, one element, which is a list with the first item, which is long, and the second item, which is a list of informations. So I can say that I have this um, sample ID at the beginning. Again, I can tell you, I can give any name I want before this dash bigger than sample ID and list of info. And I just want list of info. So by doing that, I'm changing, I'm not only changing the structure, I'm getting rid of part of the items in the channel. So I don't want this sample ID. Oops, something missing here. 
sorry, there's another bracket here. So closing this and closing the other one. So I have some info and some other info. The lung disappeared. So this is the original structure, something comma something. That's what we have here, but I just want the second part. Or maybe I just want the first item of the second part. Let's run this again. Or maybe I want to change the order. Instead of having sample ID and list of info, I want to have list of info sample ID. So as you can see, the map operator is very, very powerful. You can do a lot of things with it. If you want to, to make things uppercase, you can do. So sample ID uppercase. I think I don't remember the function name. It's uh, two uppercase, I think, maybe. Let's use reverse here, which is easier. I want to reverse this and list of info reverse. So when we run this, we're going to have lung reversed. Oops. And here I want the first one to be reversed. And let's say that the, the second one, I don't want to be reversed. So nothing happened because actually what happened here is that because the second item is a list, it reversed the order of the element. Instead of being some info and some other info, it gave me some other info and some info. But that's not what I want. So now I'm applying reverse to the specific items inside the list. And then when I run it again, I'm going to have lung and some info reversed, some other info reversed. Something's missing here. Yeah, a bracket. So we have some other info reversed, some info reversed, and lung reversed. So the map operator, I, I can't stop repeating this, it's a very important channel operator. If you master how it works, it's going to do magic for you. So here, for example, I have a channel with two elements, hello and world. So just for the sake of clarity, maybe it's not clear to you why I have two elements here. And here, uh, in my example, I have this being one element. So why is this one element and the other one is two elements? So let's copy this and compare line by line and you see the difference. So you see we have a bracket here making everything one. This and this. If we remove the bracket it becomes two elements. Okay? So let's go back. We have two elements here which is hello and world. And I want to use map so that Every element, I'm going to refer to that to it as word. I want to make it a list with word and the number of characters of that string. And then I'm going to use view with another closure, which is going to receive every element as word and len, saying word contains len letters. This is a very nice usage of, of closures. So hello contains five letters and world contains five letters. I would advise you to pause the video for a few seconds now and read all these four lines to make sure it's clear to you what's happening here. And then at the end, we have this exercise asking you to use from path to create a channel emitting the FastQ files matching the pattern data GGL star dot FQ, then use map to return a pair containing the file name and the path itself. And finally, use view to print the resulting channel. This is not really straightforward because you have to know something that we haven't showed before. But if you want to try, pause the video and I'm going to show the solution in three, two, one. So this dot name hasn't been shown before, but you could try to guess. This, if we have a file, which is a file, and indeed it is, as we know here, because it's a from path channel factory, if you do the dot name, it gives you the name of the file as a string. You could also say file dot to string, uh, open and close parentheses, but this is another way to do that. Another nice channel operator is the mix one. So the mix operator combines the items emitted by two or more channels into a single channel. So here we have a channel with one, two, and three, another channel with A and B, and a third channel with C. By using channel one mix, channel two, comma, three, comma, and so on until all the channels that you want to mix 
are listed, it's going to mix everything. And with the view, you see its content. So the mix channel is not used so often because usually you won't have such simple one items elements, right? In your channel, you have like pairs of reads or metadata and so on. But if you just have simple channels like this and you want to get them together into one channel, you're going to use the mix channel operator. Uh, one warning is that, you know, the order is not guaranteed. So we have here one, two, three, A, B, and actually we have here one, two, A, three, B, and C. The flatten operator, we saw it yesterday. So here we have channel of two elements because there are two lists. Every element has three items, but then we're going to use flatten to flatten everything into six elements. And that's what we see here when we view. The collect channel operator, we also saw it a lot already. Here we have four elements, which is one, two, three, and four. But when we use collect, we turn this into a value channel with four items in a single element. And here is what we see. The group topo is reasonably used often, I would say. Here we have a channel with a few elements. Uh, every element has two items. So one A, one B, two C, and so on. You could think of the first item as a key. And by using group topo, it will group these elements according to a key. If you don't say anything, it will be the first item. So here we have A, B, and uh, C here with one as a key. And then we have this C and this A with two as a key. And we only have D with the key three. So that's what we have. Instead of this uh, three, the seven elements, we have three, we have now one element. Sorry, instead of the seven elements, we only have three that are grouped based on these keys, one, two, and three. And we have now A, B, and C, which are the values for this key one that we saw here, the values for this key two that we saw here, and the values for the key three. So actually there's a B, also B and D they have the three so that's what we have here there's a nice exercise here so use from path to create a channel emitting all of the files in the folder data slash meta slash then use map to associate the base name prefix to each file which could be seen as a key and in the end group all these files that have the same common prefix I'm gonna you could stop the video now I'm going to show the solution in three two and one so channel from path use this path to create my channel where every element is one of the files in this folder i only have a file right but we already got the idea of the name or base name so i'm going to use map to create a topo i could use uh, the, the brackets with the base name and the path and then i'm going to group topo based on this file name so let's copy this and paste it here because I think it's a nice example to show how it works. So the path is data and meta. We have lots of things here. So for patient one, we only have one file. For patient ally two, one file. But if you go to regions, you have regions TSV, JSON, YAML. And that's what we have here, JSON, TSV, and YAML. Regions 2, we have YAML and JSON, and that's what we have here. Oh, just JSON, why? Regions, oh, sorry, it's just JSON. I read, misread this. So JSON, we only have, Regions 2, we only have JSON. So that's what we have here. And the view in the end, we have this closure here to format how it's being shown. The join operator is very interesting also. It creates a channel that joins together the, the items emitted by two channels with a matching key. So here, for example, we have X1, uh, X4, you have Y2, Y5, and Z3, Z6, and P only seven. And then when you do uh, this join of left and right, that's what you get. So P is missing in the final result because there is no P in the second channel. So this join operator can be tricky if it's not really clear to you what it is doing. So be careful when you, when you use that. The branch operator is very, very nice. I really like it, to be honest. So the idea is that you have one channel 
and you want to create other channels based on the elements in this channel, taking into consideration some conditions. So this example is going to make it clear for you. I have a channel with numbers 1, 2, 3, 40, and 50, and I'm going to create two channels. One of them is going to be called small. And every element, so the, the it here, right? Every element which is smaller than 10 is going to be in this new channel small. And everything which is bigger than 10 will be in this new channel called large. And I'm going to use a set operator to, to give a name. I could either do result equal and everything or dot set and the name at the end. I, I personally like this format because we, it's like the way you think, right? I have a channel with these values, separate this way and store this variable. So now result is a multi-channel variable. It's not a single channel. So in order to pick the channel you want to use, you have to use the dot. So result result dot small or result dot large and then you can use your channel operators like view and then we can say like one is small two is small three is small four is large 50 is large and that's the output if you run this next load script not in the order but still one is small two is small three is small four is large 50 is large So one nice example of using this branch operator, I was using it a few days ago with a colleague. So we had this channel with parent sequences and single end sequences, and we wanted to do something with the parent sequences. So we use branch to separate our channel into two channels, one with parent sequences, parent reads, and the other one with single uh, end reads. We did something with the parent ones, and afterwards we mixed them again with the single ends, right? If you go to the next load documentation, again, you're going to have a huge amount of details about all these operators that I show here, right? We have new operators appearing quite often, not quite often, but I would say every year we have a few new channel operators. So it's worth to, to, to keep an eye. Like the split JSON is, in, is one that was new. It's, it was a contribution by a community member and among others so it's a, something to, to worth keeping an eye you have buffer you have take you have many many channel operators it's very useful to to, to have a look with that we end the second part uh the, the second the third section of our training today and now we go to the latest one which is the simple rna seq workflow so actually my bad the next section is uh, cache and resume then the next one is the RNA seq one. So we played a bit already with the cache uh, feature, the resume feature before, uh, by adding the dash resume to the command line, like next flow run uh, example.nf dash resume. Uh, uh, we didn't run this in the end, so there's no cache, but I will run it twice to remind you what happens. Okay. Oh, but actually here there's no file being created so there would be no cache okay this is not a good example but we could get from the introduction one the example we had yesterday mm. okay that's the hello file it's already there my bad so let's run the next flow run uh, hello with an f let's open it the one yesterday splitting letters converting to upper and so on we have world hello if you run it again with the dash resume it will take advantage of the cache of this task having been computed already and as you can see here it cached one task of this process and two tasks of this process great nothing was computed in the end uh, however it's important to know how this mechanism behaves right how, how it works so we know there's a hash for every task and indeed we have uh, a 128 bit hash value for every task as a unique id it takes into consideration the task input values the files and the command string right? the script block that we write what the task does we have this example here with the three uh the the, the file structures as we saw before right some files and this is what's being, in the end, used to measure 
if the uh, if the inputs that we're providing now are the ones that were used before to get the answer. So in the end, it's relatively complex, but it does, it checks for an exit, exit code. So yesterday we saw dot command dot as dot command dot sh and dot command dot uh, run but actually you also have other files like the exit code here and if you do exit code you get zero which means that this task was uh, ran successfully so it checks if it was okay then compares the input in the script block and so on and then it knows there's a cache here, we don't have to recompute it again. One interesting thing is that all the time when you, when we are burning these next four scripts, I'm always saying, let's look inside the work directory, right? Because the default is to name it work, but actually you could name it anything using the, the, the dash W uh, option. Actually, you can even do next low dash dash help and see a huge amount of options that, oops, dash help right because dash dash is a pipeline parameter one dash is next low one so next low dash help oh, dash h and you see a lot of different commands that next low has and these options and then you can also do next flow run dash help dash help dash h and you're gonna see all the options of the run and one of them is the w that we are seeing now the work directory so if you are running in a, in a cluster for example you may have a scratch directory where you want the files to be written there. If you are on the cloud, maybe there's a specific a specific bucket that you want to store the intermediate files, the work directory. So you, you can decide this with the minus W, the dash W option. Um, it takes consideration the last modified timestamp. If you really want to understand how it works, the caching, I advise you to go to the Nextflow.io website, to the blog, and look for uh, Resume. And you see that there's a blog post by Abinav, which is a great blog post, analyzing the caching be behavior of pipelines. But not only that, you have other uh, blog posts like troubleshooting the Nextflow Resume and dismissifying next flow resume. So these blog posts, they get into more detail about how the resume feature works, which is not really the, the purpose here. One nice thing also is that there's a command called next flow log. I'm gonna increase here the terminal so we can see more things. The next flow log command is going to show you all the runs. As you see, we played a lot already. We ran a lot of examples of NF and there are many things we said we did. So we have a timestamp we have the duration of the pipeline. We have the run name, which is always a random adjective in a random scientist's last name, unless you provide a run name with the command line option, you can do that. If the pipeline ended successfully with an okay or with an error, the revision ID that we saw at the beginning, which is like the ID of the pipeline script, there's also a session ID in the command that you ran. Uh, you can choose the name of the run name to resume uh, like this okay one interesting thing also is that let's get this you know this uh, this scruffy Jones run name and I'm going to do next row log with its name its name and by doing that it's going to show me all the paths in the work directory of tasks of this run and here in this case you have three okay you have more in this example you can also choose uh, columns from the from the that list that we saw when we when we typed next row log, and we're going to see the process, the exit, the hash, and the duration. Right. So this hash is for the split letter process. This hash for the convert to upper, and this one for the convert to upper process. Right. The exit codes were zero. You can do next row log minus L to get a list of all the possible fields you can choose. As you can see, there's a lot of fields. You, you can do the container, for example, and in this case, we won't see much because we didn't use any container, right? Oh no, we had the nextflow.config. It contained this container, so it was run with these containers. Okay, cool. 
Mm, you can also specify like a filtering criteria here. I want only the I want to see all the test folders of the run tiny format, but only of those that the process was fastqc. If we type this here with the Scruffy Jones, there will be nothing because I think we didn't have any process with fastqc for this run name. So this Scruffy Jones was a U missing here. Oops. So nothing, right? And the minus T allows you to provide a template like for a provenance report. This is very nice. So here we have this HTML code with some placeholders for the variables. And then I can use this template. I save this as template.html and I can provide this guy here. I log the, the run name, the minus T for the template and the HTML file in the end that I want to use. And all this container work, the status, they are this, oops. There are these fields that we listed here with the minus L. So work dear status, exit, and so on. So let's do this and see what happens. Of course, we don't want this. We want this Scruffy Jones. Scruffy Jones. Okay, but we didn't create the template.html. Let me do that. Template.html. Save this. I copy pasted the HTML template, save in this file. And then I'm going to run again my command. Let's delete this because it's wrong. There was no template. Now I'm going to download to my computer. And I'm going to open this. So we have the script block, we have the exit, the status, the work directory, the container for the split letters process. For the convert to upper, one is this one, the other is this one. So you remember the chunk AA, chunk AB that we had yesterday. So you can have this very nice provenance reports by using a template that you created based on the values that you got with the next flow log minus L. You can get the queue, the process, the amount of memory, the peak memory, and so on. So for Zoom troubleshooting, you're going to see these links that I showed before in the next flow blog. They are very, very nice, but there are some common situations uh, where you're going, you're going to run into trouble with the resume. So the resume won't kick in, even though it should. If you change your input files, so let's say that you have this task that receives uh, fastq files and during the execution of your task you rename these files or you delete these files or you overwrite these files when you try to run your your pipeline with resume it will check that the input files are different and it will not be able to find the right cache and then it, it will recompute everything in this task so you should never change your input files you should always see if you change something save to another file so that the cache system will understand what's going on here. Uh, you can have some inconsistent file attributes because the timestamps matter. And sometimes some file systems, uh, such as NFS, they will change the timestamps. So you have some option to, to use a linear cache strategy that will not look for timestamp for that. Race condition is a bit more complex one, but we still mention it here, but be aware that it's not so straightforward to understand this one. The idea is that if you have a variable that is changed by two different functions at the same time, maybe when one wants to check the value, it was changed by the other one. So this race condition with global variables can break your, your, your resume. And the right way is to use the def here so that we make these variables local. So this map won't bother this other map here and then it won't break your uh, resume. Non-deterministic input channels is also a complicated stuff because if the input channel names change uh, randomly for some reason, how is Nextflow supposed to know that the input is the one that, that was there before? For the, everything is the same, but the name is different. 
how is it supposed to know that even though the name is different it's, it's the thing that you want right so be careful with the these non-deterministic input channels we have here like waiting randomly and the name of, of the output is a task index which depends on the order of this elements being being called so again this is a it could be a quite heavy and complex section because resume is not so straightforward if i remember if i remember correctly in the advanced training with rob Symes at the end of the month you will see a lot of things about not changing input variable uh, input file names and the resume feature so i think it's a better place there to get into more detail about this but what you have to know here is that the resume feature is very useful for you to start from where your pipeline stopped for some reason. Maybe you killed it, maybe there was a power outage, maybe there was some error, then you go there, you fix your error, and you don't want your pipeline to start from scratch, you want it to start from where it stopped. Also, there's something that I like a lot when I'm developing a new pipeline. So let's say I'm creating here a process foo, that's going to receive as input a val, I'm gonna call uh, name, the output's gonna be a file, called uh, I'm gonna do this name we use double quotes to resolve this variable dot txt right this script block is going to write this this variable that's getting in this name into a file called name dot txt so I'm going to write my workflow block I'm going to create a channel of A to F. I want all the letters from A to F. And then I'm going to call foo. So it's an easy, simple pipeline, one step. I'm going to run this. And to check if it worked, I can check into the files, right? So let's see, for example, so A, B, C, D, E, F, six letters, six tests, seems to be okay. Let's check this one. So code, work, complete with tab. Let's look at the dot command dot sh. Echo C in C.txt, makes sense, seems to be right. Okay, so now I want to go to the next, I'm gonna close the file explorer to get more space. Now I'm going to go to the next process of my pipeline. I want, to print the content to the screen. So I'm gonna use input a path, which is, you know, my file path. That's the one I'm going to use. The output is going to be the standard output. And the script block, it's going to use cat, which is the command line program to get whatever is inside my file path. And then I'm gonna forward the output of the full process to the bar process. If I run this with next row run except an F, it's going to run everything again. But if I already ran the first step, why should I do this again? So I'm going to use the dash resume. And as you can see, the first six tasks, they were cached already. So it worked, but oh, I can't see anything. Why? I didn't put the book through here to see everything that's echoed, but I don't want to do that. I should have actually used view here. Oops. I should have used view here to see what's inside. So there was an error in my pipeline. I fixed the error now and I'm gonna run with resume. I don't want everything to be computed again because I already worked on that. So it's cached, that's great. I fixed my error, I didn't have to wait anything because everything was cached. But let's say that I want to do more things. I want to actually use something like uh, content of uh, just content and then it when I run again what's already computed I don't have to compute again so it will be cached great content FT and so on but let's say that I want to add a third process in a fourth process in a fifth process and let's consider that instead of taking a few seconds the full step the full process for these six, these six samples, it takes, I don't know, an hour. So I just save an hour with the resume here. And the next step, which is the bar, it's going to take three hours. So now I just save four hours. 
And when you are writing a new pipeline, you keep doing that. You, you do something and you test. You change something and you test. You add a new process and you test. You saw you, you made something wrong, you fix and you test. There was an error, you fix and you test. You run your pipeline sometimes hundreds of times during development. And without the resume feature, it would be hell. It would waste a lot of time just small change, waiting an hour. Small change, waiting an hour. You go to bed because you can't work like that. So the resume feature is not only useful for people using actual pipelines, <laughs> but writing actual pipelines is also extremely useful. It's very, very nice. <laughs> With that, uh, I think we end uh, the cache and resume. We already mentioned the fair process directive a few times. It allows you to keep the order of the elements in the output channel based on the input channel, regardless of how much it took, because the resources will be offered to every element in a democratic way. So the first one will finish first, the second one will finish second, and so on. But then, because it's not parallelizing the best way it can, there is a decrease in performance. So let's go now to our final session of today, which is simple RNA-seq workflow. <laughs> now let's start the last part of our session today. So this is probably one of the most important sections uh, in this training, because finally we will write uh, close to a real life pipeline with Nextflow to perform RNA, to analysis of RNA-seq data. So in order to demonstrate this real world scenario, we will have a few steps in our pipeline. It will create an index for a reference transcriptome file. It will perform some quality control in the samples. It will perform quantification. And then it will create a MoDQC report. We will step by step together build this pipeline. And these are the multiple script files that from the very beginning we have seen around in this workspace. We're going to finally use them. <clears throat> if, you are, uh, if you are a bioinformatician, you probably know these tools, but in case you don't, Salmon is a tool for quantifying molecules, known as uh, transcripts, through a type of data called RNA-seq data. FastQC, we perform some quality control, and MultiQC organizes output from some programs to generate a nice report uh, for you. So when we start playing with them, it will become more obvious. So this is a very short uh, overview of what they are for people who have never heard of them. So they are programs that we're gonna use with the data that we have as example in this workspace to practice or uh, recently acquire Nextflow knowledge, right? So the first thing that you do uh, is to, of course, organize in your mind what you want to do, your pipeline, the inputs, output, and so on. And even though it's difficult to guess what their inputs will be for a process in the middle of your pipeline, in the beginning, it's kind of obvious. So we will need to say where the files are, the reads, their input files. We will need to tell where the transcriptome file is, the one we want to create an index out of it, and a place to store the MoDQC report. So we created these three default parameters here. Uh, we can overwrite them with the them with the dash dash read dash dash transcriptome file dash dash modqc but if we run nextflow without providing any of these options of these parameters these are the default values this dollar sign project here <laughs> is a variable that reflect the directory from where you're running the pipeline so this file is already created for us it's script one.nf it has what you were discussing until now Let's just run this pipeline, this next one script, and see what's going to happen. You, you can probably guess what's going to happen. It's just going to print to the screen reads and the param reads, right? It's going to replace, because we have double quotes, it will resolve this variable, and we have workspace, git pod, NF training, data, GDL, good, and so on. Okay. But what if I provide a dash dash reads to override instead of good? which is what we have here. What if I put lung? And that's what we're gonna have, the lung. So this is nothing new. We have learned how to play with params, uh, how to set default values, how to overwrite them with the command line with dash dash. Okay, nothing new. The first exercise is, 
let's modify this script one.nf by adding a fourth parameter because we have three so far, right? Reads, transcriptome file, and multi-QC. So let's add a fourth parameter named outgear and set it to a default path that will be used as the workflow output directory. We want some important results from, from our pipeline. We want to organize them in the outgear. And when I talk about organizing outputs, you probably remember of the published year process directive that we learned today. Okay. Let's see what we have here. Okay. So I'm going to open the result, the, the answer for this exercise, three, two, one, and that's it. So actually it's quite obvious. We just create a new parameter and we say results as the path to the folder. In the current folder, I want a folder called results and inside it, I will have my published results. Another one is to modify another exercise is to modify the script one script one at an F to bring all the workflow parameters by using a single log info command as a multi-line string statement. So now we have defined these four parameters, but only the first one is being printed, right? We want to print all of them. But I don't want to print with println. I want to print using log.info. And you've never seen this command, but actually whenever you run Xflow, there's a next flow, there, there's a dot next flow dot log file created, which is the log of the execution of your pipeline. So a lot of information are here. When you use log info, it not only is printed to your screen, but it's also printed to the log. So if there's if there's information that you want the user to see and to be in the log, you use log.info. And as mod line, uh, uh, as for mod line string, we've learned that actually if we use uh, three single quotes or three double quotes, you can create a multi-line string. And that's what we do every time when we use the script block. So there's one example here in the real pipeline for the RNA seq one. So we are using log info, the three double quotes, and some, out, some nice output with these variables to be replaced. And in the end, we have this function called the strip indent, which is to bring all this to the beginning of the of the shell, right, of the of the terminal. Uh, boundary, I don't know, instead of having this indentation. We use the indentation here to make it easier to read, but we want to strip it so that it appears normally in our screen. So I'm going to show the result, and that's what we have. Transcript tom, I'm going to show it to the file, reads out here. Good. So basically, in this first part, we learn how to define parameters in our workflow script, both the default values and how to pass parameters by using the command line to override the default values. The use of dollar sign var and dollar sign with the curly braces variable placeholders, we've played with that in, in, in the past. We know that if we want to apply a function, we put inside it here, otherwise we put outside and it's just a string, right? So we, we learned this already. How to use multi-line strings, actually we've been using them for a while in the script blocks and how to use log.info to print information and save it in the log execution file. So actually, one thing we want to do is to play with that so that you see what's actually going on. So we're gonna create a new one here, params, out here, results, and here we're gonna replace with this. So when we run this script1.nf, we know what are these values because they are the default ones here and it appears a very nice uh, description of what you're using in the pipeline. This is very useful because sometimes you will be use a pipeline written by someone else or someone else will use, a pipe, will, you, will use a pipeline written by you. And it's important to make it explicit what are the default values for some options and what the files are, or what files are being used so that you don't have to open multiple files and read the source code. It's when you run a pipeline, it's right there for you. And now when we look at the dot next dot log, it's here. We have in the log, we have the same information here in the info category, let's say there's a debug, there are other ones. So the log info will do this for you. So now let's go to the next part of our pipeline. So now, I want to start writing processes, right? The steps. So I will call this one index because I'm gonna use the program salmon with the index uh, command 
to create an index from this transcriptome reference file. So that's what I do here. I create a process, I call it index. The input is going to be path, right? And I'm going to call it transcriptome. And the output is going to be a path. In this case, it's a folder called someone underline index. And that's what the minus i someone index here is doing. It's saying that this is the folder where it, that will contain the index file that this program is going to uh, create. One nice thing here is that with someone you can tell how many threads you have available, how many CPU cards you have available to, to process this. And here we are using this uh, dollar sign test.cpus, which is the value that we have here at the beginning for the process directive CPUs. When you don't say anything, it's one, but if you had requested four CPU cores, here is how you're going to tell someone to use four CPU cores, right? We also need our workflow block. We're calling it index process with this input, which is the params that give you the path to the transcriptome reference file. And we're going to store the output channel of this process in a channel name index underline ch. Good. So let's open script two that has this content, everything we've done so far, plus the process in here. Let's copy this and run our script number two. Okay, there's an error here. It says salmon command not found. And it's clear why we don't have someone installed. So if we look at the nextcore.config, we have the process.container as this one, which means that we can run dash with dash docker and say nextload use docker and use the container image that I'm telling you in the nextcore.config, which is nextflow slash rdc dash nf. Good, now it worked. But I want to show you something. So let's go to work, to a 13 tab. I want to look at the dot command.sh. So as you can see here, the dash dash threads has one because by default, as I told you, the test CPUs will have the value one. But what if I do CPU three here and run this again? I'm going to start using dash resume because it changed here. The, the number of CPUs, the, 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 the cache won't kick in. But then if I have a look, code work B507, you're going to see the three now instead of the one, right? Here it was replaced with the name of the file. Okay, let's go back to the regular one. And if we want to run it again for some reason, I don't know, because we have the dash resume, the cache is supposed to kick in and we won't recompute that. Good. Docker is already enabled. I mean, sorry. If docker.enable was equal true, we don't need to do the dash with docker. So let's edit the nextflow.config to make docker enable true by default. Because it's very annoying to having to have to write dash with docker every time you want to run your pipeline so here we have one exercise which is to enable the docker execution by default by adding the above line to the next code.config we just did it so the next exercise is to print the output of the index underlying ch channel by using the view operator so based on what we've done so far this should be fairly simple right we just do index underlying ch view Let's run this. I'm going to erase this dash with dash docker because we don't need it anymore. Good. We have the path to the salmon index folder. If we do, if we use three here, we're going to see lots of files are created by salmon. Now it's something we already did also. So if you have more CPUs available, try changing your script to request more resources for this process. For example, see the directive docs. So we changed this to three and we saw that in the end, uh, in the command of the sage, we had a different value. We also use the tree here to see 
uh, the structure inside the, 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 the folder. Good. So the summary of this part is that we were, we were able to define a process executing a custom command with the Salmon program. Uh, we saw how process inputs are declared, how process outputs are declared, how to print the content of a channel with the view operator, and how to access and change the number of available CPUs. Actually, the right way to say that is the amount of CPUs that you requested, right? The next part is to collect read files by pairs. We also saw, we already saw this also. So let's open the script three now, which is a much simpler version, which basically is using the channel factory from file pairs with the param reads that we already saw earlier. That data GGML it has got one, got two, liver one, liver two. So we're gonna have gut and the list of files, liver and the list of files, and so on. That's why the what the from file pairs channel factory does. We can add here a view to see what's going to happen. So the script three. Good, we have gut and the list of reads, right? Here we're only passing gut as the reads, as the default, uh, as the, the path to the reads. We could auto override that to get all, gut, liver, lung, and so on, but here by default, so, so it's quicker at the first times we are trying this, let's keep only gut. And at the very end of this session today, we will do with all the samples. Uh, here we could do that, all the samples with one and two, but it's just showing the read. So I think it's okay, let's do it because it's so cheap in terms of computation. We just, uh, we are just listing the files. We are not aligning or anything, so it's not. It won't take long. So gut, liver, and lung. Good. In the end, that's what, what we will do. So the exercise here is to instead of using what we've been doing so far, like index underline ch equal blah, 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 instead of using this equal, use the set operator. And we also saw an example using this a, a, a few minutes ago. Just put the bottom. So create a channel from file pairs. This set to this being the name of the new channel. One interesting thing is to use the check if exists option in the from file pairs channel factory. This, this option also exists for, for other channel factories, like from path, we've seen this. And this exercise is, is very simple. I will pause if you wanna try to do it, but I'm going to show the result now. So you just add check if exists true. This means that if this path doesn't exist, it won't file, it, it won't fail silently. It will complain that the file or the path doesn't exist. So the summary for this very short uh, part of our pipeline is how to use the from file pairs to handle read par pair, pair files, how to use the check if exists option to check for the existence of input files, and how to use the set operator to define a new channel variable. After everything that we saw yesterday and we are seeing today, you are probably seeing that now the rhythm is, is much slower, right? Every step we are doing with a lot of care, we already saw all these channel factories, the channel operators, the options, how to create channels, we saw all of this, and now we are very slowly building block by block our pipeline. Okay, so the next is process now is the quantification process that will perform the expression quantification, right? So let's go to script number four, which has everything we've done so far, the definition of the of the parameters, the log info, the index process, the workflow block. But now we have a new block, which is a new process actually, which is the quantification one, right? So it has as input the path to the summon index, built uh, from the reference for scriptum. We have a tuple that has the sample ID and the list of reads. We build this with from file pairs channel factory. And the output is going to be, uh, it's double code, so it's, we're gonna resolve this variable, which is the name of the sample, right? So it's going to be a folder with this name. And the command is a salmon program with the quant command, same thing with the CPUs, some parameters that are specific to this program. It could be an R script, it could be a Python, anything. Uh, the output, uh, we're using this, the, this path for the index, 
and the output is going to be a folder with this name, which is sample ID. We have double quotes here, double quotes here, so these, these dollar sign variables, they will be replaced. The reads, as we know, it's a list. So here we are doing with the brackets zero and one to get the first item of the list and the second item of the list. In the workflow part, we are using the quantification, we are calling the quantification process. We are providing the output of the previous process, which was the index. We are providing a new input channel, which is read pairs ch that we built using the from file pairs channel factory. And we want the output of this process to be stored in a variable called quant underline ch. So let's run this with resume because we, we don't want to recompute everything. Let me change the, the script file is different in the input files. So the, the cache didn't, ca didn't kick in this time. But if you run it again, using now this expression that's going to run with gut, liver, and lung, you will see that gut will be cached. So it won't be recomputed again. So as you can see here, one was in cached for index and one was cached for the quantification because we already did it before. For exercise, it asks you to add a tag directive to the quantification process to provide a more readable execution log. So here we have quantification, but we don't know who is this guy. Even if we run this with unc log false, so that we have one test per line, we don't know who is three, who is one, who is two. But we could use a tag. The slow way to do it, the right way would go to the Maxwell documentation, right? Oops, not here. Okay, let's go docs, next flow. You would go here and you would go for process, directive, and you look for tag. And here you have all the information. So basically what we're going to do here is to add this tag. Usually we have an empty line separating uh, the blocks in the process, right? So tag, let's do sample ID. And the nice thing about this is that when we when we ran this again, there will be a string close to the test to the process name saying what is that. So it's lung, gut, and liver. So if I want to see the lung files now, I know this is the test that we actually have to check. And that's the, the, the result they have here. Actually the, the they would say someone on and gut, liver, lung. It's not much different. Another exercise is to add a published tier directive to the quantification process to store the process result in a directory of your choice. So you can pause the video if you want. I will show the result in three, two, one. So basically you just add published tier at the top of the process block. You say the path where you want to store and the mode which is copy. I want to copy the files. So let's do this. It's group four. I'm going to do quantification. There's a process directive, so I can put it here. The params.outdir is results. Good. Mode copy. As you can see here, we don't have a results folder, right? There's no results folder. But when we run this, a results folder will be created here. If you open it, you see a folder for gut a folder for liver, a folder for lung. But these files here inside, they are the results of the quantification process. You may ask, where is the index? We don't care. We didn't put the published year here. So during the execution of your pipeline, sometimes thousands and thousands of files will be created. And you don't really care about all these files because a lot of files, they are intermediate files. You only care about the end result of your analysis. So here in this case, we are saying it's quantification. So we put the published key directive here. So the output of this process will be stored in results, but all the files from index, they will just stay in the work directory. They won't go to our, to our results folder. So the summary of this part is how to connect two processes together by using the channel declarations we created uh, the index process. We store the output channel to index underline th then we called quantification using it and stored it to quant, to quant underline th. So we learn how to connect processes using channels. 
we learn how to resume the script execution and skip cache steps. So we saw us uh, the whole time we were playing with one uh, pair of samples. And at some point we wanted to use all of them, but the ones that we had used before, they were in cache. So what I'm trying to say here is that you can have partial caches for the same process for samples that have been run before and not for the new samples, right? We learned how to use the tag directive to make it easier to read the logs and how to use the published here directive to store a process results in a path of your choice. So you always want to use published here. Maybe just a few of the files that you want to, to publish to a results directory, but you always want to do that because having to find the files in this hash directory is not really practical. The next part is to do some quality control. So let's open the script file.nf. So begin is the same, index process, quantification process. Now we have the fast QC process. You see it's already using the tag here. So the log shows us, let's say some there was an issue with a sample and there was an error. With the tag, it's easy to see what was the sample being used when the error occurred for the task. Okay. We are going to receive just the tuple with the sample ID in the reads. So it's what comes from the from file pairs channel factory. And the output is a folder whose name that is a folder with the name fastqc underline, the sample ID name here, and underline logs. So we have the double quotes, this variable will be resolved. If we had single quotes, it will be exactly that the name and probably we would have some issue. So that's not what we want. We want this to be the content of the variable. So we use the dollar sign and the double quotes. We're going to create a folder here and we're going to use the fast QC program to do the, the quality control and start the results to this folder. Good. In the workflow block, we have this new line here, which is calling the fast QC process with the read pairs channel and storing the result in this fast QC underline CH. So let's run this fifth script with resume, so we don't have to recompute everything we have already computed. So cache, cache, the fastqc is a new thing, so there's no cache for that. Good. So these files that we have here, they are pieces of original files. So if you want to have a look at the results of this analysis, they don't really make sense because they are kind of fake data or manipulated data, so that's very quick here. To, 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 to learn next flow, <clears throat> to, to learn like next flow. This fast QC, it would take much longer. The quantification part would take much longer. The index would take longer. So for real files, it would take much longer. And the goal here is not to teach uh, bioinformatics, but next flow and writing pipelines. So we, we change a bit the data so that it's quick to run and quick to, to, to teach you how to do these things. So now let's go for the 60th script. We have a new process called mode QC. Uh, we have the published here, here because we want the report to be published. It will take everything in the test folder, so the star, everything, and the result is going to be a file named mode QC and the line report.html. And the command is just mode QC dot. It's going to take all the files in the current directory, identify what tools are that generated them, and write a report for you. So the change that now we have this multi QC call here, but look what we have. We have the quant underline CH channel, which is the output of the quantification process. And we are going to mix it with the output from the fast QC process. And when we have this channel with a lot of elements, we're going to use the collect to turn this into a value channel, which means we're going to have a single element, a lot of files. When we do that, it means that we are calling the mode QC and we're going to move we're going to create a short code of all these files in a task folder of mode QC. And with that, we're going to run a mode QC command to generate our report. So let's run this. And I'm going to also investigate with you the, the content of the folder of mode QC. So we're going to override the reads parameter to use all the six samples, the three pairs. <coughs> So we had some cache for the fast QC for one of them, but not all. And it's done. 
So we're gonna find the results, the mode QC report. Let's download it. Let's open it here. Okay, and that's the mode QC report. So as you can see, we have the percent of the bits that were aligned, uh, duplicates, the, the percent of GC, a lot of things, the fragment length distribution, uh, a lot of things. So it's a, we just use a few softwares and still we get lots of charts about our analysis. So if you go to the website of MoldQC, you see that it supports literally 100, over 100 supported tools, which means that if you use any of these tools, you will have a nice report built by MoldQC. Um, let's get into the mode QC task uh, directory. So tree work, and you see that all the output files there's a link here. The folder for the quantification of the gut, liver, lung, the fast of gut, liver, lung, all the files are here. And based on that, we can view the mode QC report. So the summary for this section is that you learn how to collect many outputs to a single input with the collect operator. That's what we are doing here, right? How to mix these channels together and how to chain two or more operators together because we are using mix here, we are using collect, and we are passing all that as a single channel to mode QC as input. One nice thing with Nextflow is that you can also handle some events. So let's look at the script 7.nf. It has everything we've done so far, but it has this new block called workflow.onComplete. So basically what it does is whenever the workflow is completed, next flow we will see what's inside this block. And here it's gonna use log.info to check if the workflow ended with a success, so workflow.success will return true, it's going to say to log.info, done. Open the following report in your browser and it's going to give you the path to this file and then a new line. Otherwise, it's going to say, oops, something went wrong. So this expression, look at a ternary expression, you have like, if this is true, do this. Otherwise, do the thing after the column. If we run this script 7 for all the samples, well, I believe everything is going to be cached. It should just say hello, done, everything went according to plan. So open the following report. Okay, everything cached and done. Why mode QC has only one task if it's getting six samples? Because we use collect, right? To make everything into one element with multiple items. You can also get email notifications. You can configure some SMPT, SMTP server to send an email so that uh, when your pipeline is, is finished, you get an email saying your pipeline is finished with success or there was a failure or something like this. You can also play with some custom scripts. So at some point here, we, we were using uh, FastQC and basically we, we had just like an MKDIR and the FastQC command, so two lines. But sometimes your script block can get very, very long and you don't want to have in your workflow script a lot of content that is not really in the logic of the pipeline. So one thing you can do is to create a script. So let's do that. I'm going to create this fastqc.sh. It's a shell script, right? I'm going to put this content inside. Oops. The first argument is going to be sample ID. The second argument is going to be reads. I'm going to create the folder. I'm going to run the fastqc program just like I did before. But now, in the script 7 file, I will replace these this two lines here. I'm going to just say, you know, run this fastqc program with this two information here. Of course, there are a few things we have to change. The first thing is that you have to make use X mode, uh, change mode plus X to the file to make it executable so that you, you can execute it. You have to create a folder called bin and move your program inside. It's the same thing if you have an R script, a Python script, another program that you have. Uh, it's not heavy as a script. You don't have to install it. It's a custom one. You put everything to the bin folder. 
because by doing so, when you run your tasks, Nextflow will automatically stage that script, those scripts that are there, for your task to be able to use it. And that's what we are doing here. By putting it in bean, when we say fastqc.sh, the task will know where to find the script because Nextflow staged it. So we can do it like this, and it's going to work. The detail here is that because we changed the script block, there's no cache anymore. So it will recompute this part. And the mode QC also, because it depends on the fast QC and the fast QC changed. So whenever you have a, a difference in the process, the ones that depend on it, we also have to be recomputed because what this computes changed, right? So the summary for this part is how to write or use existing custom scripts in your next flow workflow and then how to avoid the use of absolute paths by having your scripts in the bean folder. So you can ask, Marcel, uh, why do I have to use Conda or Container to use Salmon, but to use the script that just put it in the bean folder? So usually programs, they have different versions, they are being updated, they have some other complex configurations, they have dependencies. So some programs are very complex to, to, to manage, and then it's better to use Conda or a container to, to organize all these things. For custom scripts that you wrote by hand, like a NAR script or something, where there are not a lot of dependencies, you can just use the scripts in the bean folder, and it would be much easier. Also, you could have this script in any other place in your computer, but if you have the absolute path, if by accident or for any other reason you move this script to another place, it will break your pipeline. If I try to use your pipeline, it won't work, because maybe your path is slash home slash John slash something. In my case, it's not John, it's Marcel. So using absolute paths is a very bad thing. You shouldn't do that. And by putting everything to the bean folder in the project, di project directory of your pipeline makes it work in any computer. So that's the preferred way to do it. There's still something we need to do. Let's use this dash with report and dash with trace, dash with timeline, dash with tag, next low command. It's going to generate a lot of nice things for us. So the same command we were using before. Actually, now we're going to use the rna nf next row pipeline, which is similar to the one we built, but there are some extra things. Maybe we have to stick the version, let's see. Okay, it worked. So we have the tag here, so you can see. Uh, index is this one, first QC, first quant, not QC, blah, blah, blah. So we are supposed to get a few extra files. Okay, it's over. So we are supposed to get a timeline, so let's download this file and see what it does. The trace file, we can see here, it has some information about every task, the ID, the name, the exit, how much resources it used, but it's, it's a very raw file, let's say. We have a report also, let's download that, and we have a DAG. So let's also, okay, the leg that we can see here. So every node, the channels going around, there are, you can also generate a better DAG, but let's stop with this here. But you can generate with Mermaid, uh, interactive DAGs, and a lot of different things. Let's see the report. Let me open the file here, the report and the timeline. So this is the timeline. It shows you uh, for every process, how long it took to, to stage the files, right? The, the gray part and the blue part is where the, the processing was really happening. For this one, for this one. So you see there's some parallelization here between FastQC and index, and also with the quant and FastQC. In the end, MultiQC had to wait until everything stopped, and it took a while to stage the, the output file. So this is the timeline. It shows during the time how the tasks uh, took place. And in here, we have the report uh, with some information about the pipeline. We have some plots here. This is, a, as I said, it, like the files were made in a way to make it really quickly, so we don't have a nice uh, plot, but we know that there will be some uh, some plots here on CPU usage, the percent allocated, memory, job duration, input and output, read and write, all these tasks here with information about them, uh, the peak memory, the duration. So it's a, it's a nice report that you can have for every Nextflow pipeline that you run. Another thing that we can do is to run a Nextflow pipeline straight from GitHub. So every time here we've been doing Nextflow run, 
some lookout in that file, but actually you can use something like, I think that's the name of the pipeline. Let's see. Yes. So by doing next load run, mhiveradantas slash hello to, because I didn't say where it is, by default, it's going to check on GitHub. And indeed it was on GitHub, slash my namespace and the name of the repository. If I had plot before GitLab, uh, Bitbucket, whatever, it would run, it would look for it there. Same way that when we don't say anything, it's gonna look for the container in the Docker Hub container registry, but you can also say quay.io and it's going to look in quay.io. So it clones the repo, it pulls the repository, it organizes all the files, it runs for you the script and, and you can see everything here, right? You can also get some information about some pipelines. So nextflow info, nextflow-io, rnc-nf. You can get some info about this pipeline by typing this command. So here we have to, to choose a revision. Actually, I mean, it shows the revisions, but it's the default one, which is master. It has some description, who is the author, the description of the pipeline, the main script file, the local path, where it's stored. So when we do the nextflow pool, or when you do the run with the remote uh, pipeline, it will store it in dot next flow slash assets in your home directory. We can also choose a specific revision of the pipeline. We are using master, but it could have chosen v2.1, for example, it's a branch. It would work just fine. There are other resources that you can use to find more things about next flow and so on. The next flow documentation is always a great place to go. This next flow patterns is very nice. So the next flow patterns basically, okay, let's be. The next flow patterns is this repository. You have indeed a website, which are common things people ask that are not so straightforward, and you have here how to do them. So what if I want to process all outputs all together? So clicking here, you have this problem, a solution, and some code here. You also have uh, how to get the process work directory and have here how to do it, which is escaping the dollar sign. We saw it before. How to do optional, optional inputs, and then also show you how to do it. I also created a repository uh, on my namespace, which is next flow snippets, which has a similar purpose, but it's only a GitHub repository. There's no website but because GitHub can render Markdown, it's almost the same thing. So how can I get the first N elements from a channel? And here, you, by clicking, you will see, uh, it's taking a while to load, the problem and solutions. Some Sometimes I have some pictures. So, you know, sort lexicographically paths in a list within a table. And then I have, this is what I have, what I want, Blah, blah, blah. I have some code here using map and so on. In the end, this is the output, right? So there are multiple different places where you can find information about uh, Nextflow. Definitely a great place to look is the Slack. So you have the Nextflow Slack that you can join. The Nextflow.io community, click on Slack community chat. You'll get the invite. It's a great place to ask. The Nextflow blog. It's a great place to, to read about Nextflow. There is the channel's podcast. You have a podcast talking about uh, the news in the Nextflow world. There are some technical discussions sometimes. It's a very nice podcast. Uh, and tomorrow you will have, let's see here, the third and last day of this training with Chris Hackard. It's going to be a day focused on NF Core. So you're going to see the NF Core best practices, pipelines, modules, sub workflows, tools for users and for developers. So it's, it's a great day, it's a very important day. And I hope that I was able to, to teach you the basics, the foundational concept of Nextflow so that tomorrow you can take the best out of the training. So don't forget, uh, you're more than welcome to ask any question in the channel on the NFCOR Slack. And uh, even if it's not during the, the streaming of the videos, right, you can ask at any time. We're gonna leave the channel open even for a few days maybe a few weeks after the training is over. So you can ask all the questions there that you want. And I hope you enjoyed the, the, the session today. So see you in another opportunity. Bye-bye.